Thank you to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. Hi there, today we're going to take another look at some exam problems from the Indian JEE advanced exams. Specifically, we're going to look at problems that have got to do with electric field and flux. Now, this problem that you're looking at right now is from the 2018 paper two, and it's from question three of the physics section. Specifically, what we're looking at here is that we have an infinitely long, thin, non-conducting wire which is parallel to the z-axis and carries a uniform line charge density of lambda. It pierces into a thin, non-conducting spherical shell of radius r in such a way that the arc PQ subtends an angle of 120 degrees at the centre. The permittivity of free space is epsilon naught. Which of the following statements are true? So part A asks us to basically find the electric flux through the shell and asks us if it's the square root of 3 r lambda over epsilon naught. Now the electric flux is the rate of flow of electric field through a given area. And usually we find the electric flux through something called Gauss's law. So if we are to denote our electric flux with this symbol, then what Gauss's law states is that the total electric flux out of a closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed divided by the permittivity. So in this case, that's epsilon naught. If we wanted to write this in integral form, it would be a line integral. Uh, and then we would have E, our electric field, dot product with a change in area. So these are vectors here. Um, and this means that if there's an angle between the electric field and the area that it's passing through, you will times it by cosine of theta, where theta is that angle. For this problem, though, I think we can just use uh, this form of Gauss's law. So what we want to start off by finding is indeed the charge enclosed in our surface. So our spherical shell will be our Gaussian surface and we want to find the total charge inside of there. Now the total charge is coming from this section PQ of our charged wire. So I'm going to call that distance PQ D and the total charge that is enclosed um, will be found by multiplying d by lambda because this is the density of charge along the line per unit area. So let's have a look at this triangle and we can actually find out what d is using some trigonometry. So if we cut this angle in half it's going to be 60 degrees on each side. That's r there and we can see that sine of 60 degrees is going to be equal to um, the opposite over the hypotenuse. So our opposite side will be this distance here, which will be half d, or d over 2. And it will be that divided by the hypotenuse, which in this case is r. So to rearrange that for an expression for d, we have d is 2r sine of 60 degrees. And if we wanted to find our Q, we just times that all by lambda. Now, if you can have a look here, to find our flux, we would just take this line that we found and divide it by epsilon naught. But that wouldn't give us this answer here, and it wouldn't give us the other option that they're presenting, which is um, in part C here. So what we actually need to do to be able to verify this answer is to convert sine of 60 degrees into an exact amount. So I'm going to draw a triangle that's going to help us do that. I'm going to draw an equilateral triangle as best I can, which means that all of the sides are the same length. If that's true, then all of the angles will be 60 degrees. And like I said, all the sides will be the same length, so they could be any length, um, we'll set them equal to 2. So every side has a length of 2. Now, this triangle, if we were to cut it in half there, well, we'd end up with 30 degrees on this little part. 
and the length of this line down the center would be the square root of 3. That's because this adjacent side down here would be equal to 1. Now from looking at this triangle we can see sine of 60 is going to be the opposite over the hypotenuse. Sine of 60 can be written as square root of 3 over 2. That's it as an exact value. So let's go back over and write out our flux. It is going to be 2 lambda r times sine of 60, which is this, all of that divided by epsilon naught. All right, so we do that, our twos cancel, and what we end up with is exactly this amount. We get our flux is square root of 3 r lambda over the permittivity. All right, so part A is a correct answer here. By the same argument, C is not going to be correct because it can't be both A and C at the same time. All right, let's look at B. The Z component of the electric field is zero at all the points on the surface of the shell. Well, that is actually going to be true because the electric field that comes out of this charged wire here is going to come out radially. That means that in the Z direction, which is up and down, there aren't going to be any components of the electric field. Um, so this one is correct that the Z component will be zero. All right, so let's look at D. The electric field is normal to the surface of the shell at all points. Well, what I just said was that out of this line here, the electric field is always going to be radial. Um, so if it's radial out of here, it might be perpendicular to the shell, but at points here as the shell is curving, it's not always going to be normal, so it's not always going to be perpendicular, so I'm going to say that D is not true. That's all for that question. Hope there aren't any mistakes. I have made a few mistakes in my previous videos and people have pointed them out in the comments, so thank you for that, um, but hopefully no more mistakes. Exams love throwing weird little flux problems at us in all kinds of crazy geometries. Um, so I guess the more we practice, the more we're going to be able to do in the pressure of an exam situation. So let's have a look at one other problem. So this is what we're dealing with for our next question. It's from the 2017 paper. It's from paper two and it's question 10 of the physics section. We have a point charge Q placed just outside an imaginary hemispherical surface of radius r and they're asking which of the following statements are correct. A. That the electric flux passing through the curved surface of the hemisphere is this value here. Now one trick that we're going to use to find the electric flux in this problem is to note that because the point charge is actually outside of our surface, the net flux is going to be zero. That's because any flux that enters through the top surface, through the curved part, is also going to exit out through this disk on the bottom. So I'll write that down here that the net flux is going to be equal to zero. That means that we can equate the curved surface flux or anything entering the surface, we'll denote that as flux C for curved, will be equal to the negative of all the flux that leaves the surface through the disk on the bottom. So that's flux of the disk. Now, Question A is asking us only about the flux through the curved surface. Um, it would be a lot harder to find that though because we'd have to integrate over this hemisphere. What we're going to instead do is find the flux of the disk, take the negative of that value and that should give us the flux of the curved surface. So how are we going to find flux? Well we can uh, use Gauss's law again but this time in integral form. So we're going to have the electric field cosine of theta dA. So this is essentially the dot product between the electric field uh, and the area that it's passing through. So electric field will come out of this source charge. It moves away from positive charges and towards negative ones. So this is our electric field. Um, 
Then this here is our angle theta. This is just for the disc. Uh, and we're going to integrate over the area of the disc. So I'm going to set this distance here to be little r, the radius of the disc where the electric field is passing through. And we're going to integrate over that entire bottom area. So a general form of the electric field is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. Now this is Coulomb's constant, and that's going to be uh, multiplied by Q, which is our source charge, over the distance squared. This is the distance from the charge to the surface. So in our case, we can find out the distance. It's going to be this hypotenuse of the triangle here. We can find that through Pythagoras, and if we square it, this is going to be equal to Coulomb's constant times Q over big R squared plus little r squared. Now we also are going to want to find an expression for cosine of theta, and again we can find that from Pythagoras, or trig here in this triangle. Cosine of theta is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse was that distance, so we'll have this expression here. I'm going to grab another piece of paper to write down our expression for the flux because I think we're going to need a little bit of extra room here. Okay, what have we got? Flux of the um, disk is going to be the integral of E, so I'm going to write down this here, times cosine of theta. times dA. So this is going to be integrating over the entire disk. If we treat uh, each element of the integral as a ring on the disk, we could have 2 pi r. So that's each little ring at each uh, different radius going outwards. Um, and then that's going to be dR over the entire disk. This is the integral we're going to solve, and its limits are going to be r from 0 to big R, the radius, so that's when it's all the way at the perimeter there. Let's just focus on this integral now. We're going to start by throwing all of our constants out the front. Um, so we've got the Coulomb's constant, Q, also big R, and our 2 pi will come over here. What we have left with is this right here. Okay, so we're going to take a gulp of air and do a little substitution to integrate this. Our substitution is going to be that uh, u is equal to this down here, uh, which means that du dr would be 2r, meaning that uh, du is 2r dr. Now we can spot an r dr in our integral here, so we can replace that with du over 2. Um, and let's go through. I'm not going to write out the constants each step. I'm going to refer to them as a mess of constants. Um, and let's do the substitution. Let's think about what our new limits are going to be. If little r is 0, u will be big R squared. And if this is um, r, we're going to have u is 2r squared. Doing this integral here, which is a reasonably easy one, we get, don't forget our mess of constants, minus 1 over square root of u. Uh, we're going to have some 2s that cancel during that integral. Uh, from our limits, Uh, let's compute that limit. So we're going to have minus 1 over 
to our squid. That's going to be equal to all of our constants, so I'll bring them back over here. Pi is cancelled in that mess of constants. Um, times this, which will become 1 over r, 1 minus 1 over root 2. Okay, looking at that, uh, these r's are going to cancel. And what did we actually want to figure out? Uh, what we just calculated was the flux of the disk, which means that if we wanted the flux of the curved surface, we just need to stick a negative sign in front of this. And actually what we would get is the answer they have here. So A is a correct solution. Let's look at part B. The total flux through the curved and flat surfaces is this value. Well, we already knew and used the fact that the total flux net flux is going to be zero because the charge is outside the surface, so B is not correct. Uh, part C, the component of the electric field normal to the flat surface is constant over the surface. All right, so how do we find the component of the electric field that is normal to the flat surface? Uh, we want to take this vector and I essentially make it go straight up and down, so we want to take um, our electric field that we have already been dealing with and we want to times it by cosine theta that would give us the electric field that is normal en if we were to do that we would take this value right here our e and times it by this value right here our cosine theta I can write that out for you And any way you look at that right there, uh, we still have a dependence on little r, which is the radius. So this is not going to be constant over the flat surface because the little radius is going to be changing over the flat surface. So this value is not constant and that's going to be incorrect. Part D, the circumference of the flat surface is an equipotential. So, um, you know, when little r is equal to the radius all the way around that circumference, um, all those points are the same distance from our point charge. So if we were to look at our electric field, uh, little r would be equal to big R, and this would just be 2 r squared down the bottom here. Uh, and that would be constant all around that point. They're all the same distance away, um, and that's all it took. So yes, d will be correct. And so there we go, we've solved another flux problem just like that. Working through problems like this and getting through the academic side of science can really start to suck the enjoyment out of the subject. If you're looking for a way to renew some of your motivation, then you could check out this video's sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream have tons of documentaries and non-fiction titles that will help remind you why learning is awesome and why the study is worth it. I've just started a series called Digits hosted by Derek Mueller from Veritasium and he takes us on a deep dive of the internet. If you go along to curiositystream slash tibbies and use the code tibbies during sign up then the first month is free. So thank you to Curiosity Stream for supporting my channel and thank you for watching.